Thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm going to try and be a little bit provocative in, in this talk. Um, I hope I don't upset people. Um, I'd like to see how SETI can benefit big history and also how, how big history can, can benefit SETI. Um, I want to start off being critical about astronomers. Um, we have a few astronomers in the audience today who I think are typically open-minded, but I don't think that characterizes the whole population, I have to say. Um, astronomers are very kind of fixated by everything that's sort of up there. Uh, and to me, that's a bit of a problem because they, they tend to ignore almost what's happening in this planet. So anything that's less than above the atmosphere doesn't seem to be terribly interesting. Uh, and they also neglect the fact that there's life on this planet and there's people on this planet, intelligent life. Uh, and to me, uh, that's not really the way to look at the universe. You need to have a, a much bigger picture. The fact that there's intelligent life on this planet is actually important for the interpretation of the universe as a, as a whole. So I'll, I'll start off being critical on my own field and, and maybe also be thereafter a little bit critical about, about big history. Um, so, so this is the sort of big history view. At least this is one of the one of the figures you'll see if you put into Google big history timeline, then they, they look sort of mostly um, like this. Uh, it, it starts off incredibly broad, uh, looking at the, the, you know, the Big Bang and the way the, the, the universe evolved, at least over the first you know, 400,000 years, the first maybe a few million, 100, 100 million years or so. Um, and then it quickly focuses, in my mind. It quickly becomes very, very narrow. And it focuses on life on this planet and, and human development. And it doesn't, doesn't really quite get out of that rut until it starts thinking um, about the future. Um, you know, this is, this is astrobiology. Um, this is the kind of stuff that Ian has been teaching for, for many decades. So that's really the sort of foundations of, of big history. Uh, I think what big history adds, and I think it's, it's very important, um, is understanding human development and, and the, big, the big picture of that. So uh, I'm not saying this is, this is wrong, but I don't like the way the focus narrows so, so quickly. And it's certainly a story that should be told. Um, and it's a, it's a story that's important, I think, that everyone knows the story. Um, but I think there's some caveats to that, and, I, and I'll talk about some of those caveats um, here. Um, I think big history, but probably astronomy as well, and cosmology, I think, uh, but especially big history because you have, you have people who are trying to understand this whole story, uh, and they're experts on a small part of it. Um, so that kind of simplifies the discussion, I think, simplifies the, the presentation, and often, um, when I look at my own, own field of expertise, which is astrophysics, um, I don't think it recognizes the limitation um, of our knowledge. Now, we've had, um, we've had Medio here, who, of course, is a cosmologist, and uh, more or less said that, you know, we understand everything about the universe and how it expanded, etc. Uh, I, I would challenge that. Um, and I think we've seen, actually, from all the work that cosmologists have done over the last 10 years, looking at the cosmic microwave background, um, that in fact we only really understand a, a tiny fraction um, of, the, of the universe. So we know this, what's called baryonic matter. We know pretty much what that's done in the past and perhaps what it will do in the future, creation of stars, galaxies, planets, etc. cetera. Um, that's part of the universe that we, we know really well, but then there's all the other stuff that we don't really have a, a clue about. You know, we've been thinking about what dark matter, or we've, we've, we've been told that we'll understand dark matter, uh, what it is, um, for the last 30 years, and we still don't actually understand what, what dark matter is. There are many candidates, um, but no one has actually detected dark matter. No one can say what it is. Uh, and even worse is, you know, dark energy, which is com one of the, the major components of the, of the universe in terms of its, its energetics. We don't know what dark energy 
is. So there's, there's a huge amount of things that we don't actually understand about physics and the universe, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't pretend otherwise, and we shouldn't teach it otherwise. Um, and, and, and actually, there are a long list of things that we, we don't understand and, and we don't know. Okay, we talked about dark matter, talked about dark energy. There's also inflation. We, we think that inflation happened because it describes the observations that we see um, in the cosmic microwave background, but we don't understand why inflation happened, this exponential expansion of the universe at very uh, early times. Um, ten years ago, a cosmologist would have come up here and, and told you what the fate of the universe is. A uh, cosmologist would not do that today, and that's partly because, you know, for example, dark energy, we don't know whether that's a constant or whether it's changing with time. We don't know if it will increase with time or whether it will decrease with time, so we don't actually know what the, what the fate of the universe is. Um, we certainly don't know how chemistry becomes uh, biology. Uh, we don't know if there's life beyond this planet. Uh, it, it's easy to say there must be life out there, but actually we don't know. We don't even know in our own solar system whether there's life on Mars at the moment, our nearest sort of neighbor. So many things that we don't know. Propagation of life is another dimension that might be quite important. Panspermia is something that's perhaps making a comeback. I think it would be very interesting if that was the case. Um, and also there's ideas that there actually may be many universes out there with different um, uh, cosmological parameters that work in different ways and may be better for life or worse for life, better for intelligence, worse for intelligence. So there are many things out there that we don't understand and we shouldn't, we shouldn't pretend otherwise. Um, the other question I want to ask is, you know, does it actually matter? And does it matter to us here on this planet, thinking about how our future will evolve if we understand cosmology and we understand our origins? Does it really have any consequence um, at all? Um, you know, you know, does deep knowledge of these things actually mean that we can make better decisions going forward in the in the future? Um, and I think um, I think either Claudio or Amidio, I think it was Amidio already mentioned that, you know, if you take two very different theories of the universe, you know, you have the, the sort of model that we have just now, which is there's a big bang and then there's an expansion of the universe and that expansion has accelerated over the last few billion years. If you compare that to another uh, theory of the universe that only 60 years ago was very much still considered to be a possibility, the steady state theory that the universe always was and always will be. It had a little hiccup when we realized that the universe was expanding, but that was got round by introducing the creation of matter so that the, the matter and the energy density of a, solid, uh, of a st steady state uh, universe remain constant. Um, so th these are very, two very different theories of the universe, but does it actually matter? I mean, of course, it's good to tell the story. It's good for people out there to understand the big picture, but does it matter that one theory fits better with the observations than, than, than another? Um, so I was thinking about that, and the, the only thing that I can think of, and I think Emilio has already mentioned this, is that a steady state universe, because essentially it's always has been and always will be, means that anything can happen in that universe, and so we could almost certainly say that we are not alone at least sometime in the past or sometime in the future, there was or there will be um, other life in the, in, in the universe. Um, so big history also focuses on these thresholds of um, complexity and, and puts a lot of emphasis on those. Um, I'm, I'm not so particularly keen on that approach. It also worries me that there's this huge gap. If you look at these timelines on big history, yeah, there's nine billion years of big history where apparently nothing happened. You know? until, the, until the Earth formed, uh, nothing happened during this point, which is complete nonsense. Now, this is actually astrophysics that, that's happening in between here. Um, so for example, Many things are happening. We have the era of active galactic nuclei. We have the era of massive star formation. Um, we have the peak in cosmic star formation happening around here. This is where most of the stars 
in the universe are actually happening a few billion years after the Big Bang, long before the solar system formed. Uh, so some of these things, I think, can be potentially misleading, especially when you have this, this strong focus on uh, the solar system and the development of, of life on our own, our own planet. So, so what does SETI bring to the table? Well, I think one thing that, 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 that SETI brings to the table um, is to think beyond this narrow focus, to think about life not just on this planet but on other planets um, within this galaxy but also um, other galaxies. Um, and I like to think that what we have here um, is really a sort of cosmic foundation. Um, probably all the phenomena in the universe you know, can be associated at some point with this common origin. I think things that happen after this could be quite different in, in, in different places, but we have a foundation uh, on, on, on which to kind of, we all have a foundation on which to build. Uh, so this is, this is actually what big history is. So it's this plus something that's kind of, well, this, this is the nine billion years where nothing happens. Uh, and then this is what happens, you know, when the, when the solar system forms five billion years ago. Uh, you have simple life 3.8 billion years ago, and then you have intelligent life, uh, and then you have a technical civilization over maybe the last few hundred years. Um, what I think SETI does is, you know, it opens us up to, to this much bigger picture. It really puts the big back into big history. Um, this is us, but potentially, there are many different forms of life in the universe, simple life, potentially intelligent life, um, technical civilizations, uh, artificial intelligence, all these things can be out there, um, but they have this sort of cosmic uh, foundation. And it might be very difficult, and, and we've heard that certainly in some of the talks this morning, but in principle, um, there can be some sort of engagement between these civilizations. And I'm not talking about a conversation, but at least there can be information transfer from one of these strands to the, to the other. Um, so in, in principle, there are many big histories out there, and they all can be quite different in many ways. So, so that's, to me, that's incredibly exciting that there's more than just us, that there are all these other possibilities, and there must be so much that we can learn um, from, from those possibilities. Um, so I, I was trying to kind of um, draw this last night. I'm not sure I really did a very good job on it. Um, but, you know, life as we know it, so this is us here. Um, we, we think we might have another branch of intelligent life, which is artificial intelligence that might become independent from our, from our own branch of biological intelligence. There might be something else that happens in the future that we, that we don't quite understand. Um, and with these cosmic foundations, there, there are all these different possibilities also branching off in ways that, that we don't know about and we don't understand. Uh, now, I know this is quite speculative, um, but uh, I, mean, I think there's just so, such an abundance of possibilities that it's incredibly exciting and also the potential for engagement between them. And then there's life as we don't know it, so things we don't know, um, which could still be considered to, to have the characteristics of, of life. Um, but not actually be life as we know it. And then there are, you know, the fact that we don't know everything about the universe. Maybe there's other stuff out there that's conscious, that tries to understand the nature of the universe, um, but wouldn't be described uh, in the sort of laws of biology that, that we understand, or any enhancements or changes to those uh, laws. So, all of this is, it hugely expands, I think, the way we can think about the universe, and I think also hugely expands big history and astrobiology and SETI, etc. I think SETI brings um, that to the, to the table. Um, so, so what can big history do for SETI? Well, I think we've heard in various forms um, that, of course, we want to know what our future is. We want to know what the future is of you know, our own civilization, our own technical civilization. That would be very important to understand what the chances are of detecting other civilizations, you know, the longevity uh, of a civilization. Can we overcome the challenges that we all face um, at the moment as humankind? Um, do we do civilizations, biological civilizations, technical civilizations, do they all enter a post-biological phase? 
Um, you know, what, what fraction of technical civilizations truly become spacefaring? Uh, can, can we expect that typically galactic colonization is inevitable? I think these are things that, 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 that big history can, can at least um, think about and, and focus on and, and give us some feel for. Because a SETI search, for example, that you do really depends on a lot of these things. If, if a SETI signal is incredibly rare, um, and this is the work that um, uh, Amidio was talking about, or Claudio, I forget what you call Claudio. Um, you, you really need to be able to search the whole sky instantaneously, for example. If the signals are out there, but they're just very faint, then you just, you just keep on one point of the, of the sky. So there are a lot of things here that would inform the best way to conduct uh, SETI searches. Now, I won't, I won't go through all of this, but um, I think it's also true, and I think Ian also mentioned this, that uh, so far, of course, we haven't detected any signals. Um, astronomical data, even though our instruments are much better than they were in the past, we never need to invoke artificial signals or artificial phenomena to actually describe uh, what, what is out there. There's certainly no signature of advanced civilizations that, that use a lot of energy in astronomical data. Now, I should talk to the previous speaker because that, that's rather uh, contra to, to, to your um, position, at least proposal. Uh, the solar system means done a lot of work in the solar system's absolutely pristine, which is very worrying because it suggests that we've not been visited before, or if, they, if, they, if we have been visited, then they've cl cleaned up their, their mess pretty well. Um, again, going back to some of the previous talks, you know, it, it's a really tough problem because the Milky Way is just, it's just so big it's been around for so many billions of years. Uh, and the speed of light, when you, when you look at these dimensions, you know, the speed of light is actually rather slow. At least for the SETI application, the speed of light uh, really is a problem. Um, civilizations may be short-lived. The technology that we're looking for may also be short-lived. Intelligent life might be rare. So there's, there's lots of potential problems out there. Um, and of course, the question is, you know, you know, how do, we, how do we go beyond those problems? How do we actually make that detection? And I, I sometimes think maybe it's a technical breakthrough that we're looking for. So for example, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutchman who, who built very good microscopes, you know, he uncovered that whole microscopic uh, universe, uh, micro, uh, microbiology, which had been under our no noses for you know, billions of years, was the predominant, is the predominant life form on the planet, but 250, 300 years ago, we had no idea that that, that was the case. And that's a technical uh, breakthrough, but perhaps um, it's actually another kind of breakthrough that we're looking for. Maybe it's an ethical breakthrough. Maybe it's a maturity in a, in a civilization that, that is related to all of these things together uh, and, and that come about once you're mature enough to engage um, with the rest of intelligent civilization in the, in the universe. And of course, some people also say, well, actually, maybe humans are just not up to the job of being able to recognize um, intelligent civilizations that might be out there, might be under our noses, and maybe our machines will do better. Maybe our machines will discover their machines. Um, so what else does, does the SETI bring to the, to the, to the table? Um, certainly gives us this large-scale perspective. Um, but, you know, if this really is the case, if we are still doing SETI in 10,000 years from now, uh, and, and this is the result that there's only us, then that would be really, truly fundamental. You know, if we are really alone, um, that would be, as, as Arthur C. Clarke said, just equally as terrifying as the idea that there are other civilizations out there. And if that is the message that SETI is bringing us, that actually intelligent life is, is rare, that in particular technical civilizations might be rare, then the other message, and I think this is a message that's also relevant to, to big history, is that we need to take better care um, of this planet. It might be unique in the, in the universe. I, I don't really believe that, but I think it might be rare. Intelligent life might be rare. Uh, so we need to take care of the planet. Um, we need to take care of each other. Um, but that's not just our friends and family, that's every one of us that shares this fantastic cosmic spaceship that takes us around the, the Earth every year and, and around the galaxy 
every uh, quarter of uh, uh, 250 million years. So I think that's also something that SETI brings to the table is really um, expanding our thoughts. Big history does a good job, but, but there's actually more to do out there. Um, so I shall, I shall leave it there, and uh, thank you very much. is to 